All right. Welcome to the Everyday Board Game Podcast with Daniel. And Daniel. And today we have a couple special guests here. This is our weekly board game breakdown where we take a publisher or a designer and we break down their entire body of work and as far as games go. And we have a, two very special guests. We have Brad from Level 99 Games. Hey, good to be here with you. Welcome to join. And Josh from Level 99 Games. Hey, how's it going? So, viewers of our channel will already be fairly familiar with Josh. He, he gives us lots of great commentary during our uh, board game debates. Lively <laughs> debates? Yeah, he, he, he's one of our viewers that really like puts forward like good, solid arguments for or against different games with us, which is entirely the point of it. And uh, I know these two guys going way back. I used to live in Albuquerque, where you guys are based out of, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, you're in our playtest group. Yeah, I I love being in that playtest group. That was is it still? Do you guys still have playtesting? I mean, obviously not right now, right? Not but, right now. <laughs> uh, we have an office now, and so we run the playtesting event out of our own office every other week. Oh wow, that's awesome! So you guys don't go to the store anymore, then, huh? No, not anymore. No, that's fair. I mean, yeah, it was it was an okay place to group, but if you're if you're working on a project, you know, it's. Yeah, we wanted something that was a little more uh, where we could focus on our, our you know specific projects and specific testing objectives, um, and that was a little easier to do in our own closed venue than in a public open space. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. How has that been going? Pretty good until, of course, we had to <laughs> shut the office for for the coronavirus crisis. But uh, we're looking forward to getting back to it uh, once things settle down. Yeah, definitely. Well, I mean, I, I noticed that you guys are doing a lot more playtesting on uh, Tabletop Sim as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's been really great for us throughout the, the whole crisis. Yeah, definitely. That's a, it's a good transition. So what we're going to do here is we're going to start off by pretty much the older, oldest games that are listed on uh, Board Game Geek. The viewers at home and the video, you can see the Level 99 uh, website right here. Quite straightforward. Uh, beautiful new logo, by the way. I remember the older logo, but I, I really dig the minimal design. Thanks. Yeah, that's really neat. Um, so we have their main page here, and we're just going to go run through their the gameography and hear some stories about the games. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, yep. So You said there were 176 or something on BGG? 175 listings, yeah. Wow. <laughs> and so... Wow. It's been a long ten years. It has, it has right? That long. Yeah. I mean, a lot of those are single promos. And right. Yeah, yeah, we've done quite a bit. Yeah, it, enough. That that's more than most publishers. <laughs> you know, even even with that. I mean, granted, we're not going to go over all 175. That would take way too long, and it'd probably be boring. But I noticed your website says tabletop games for a video game generation. Explain to me what that means. Yeah. So you know, we all grew up playing video games. Um, I know that like when I was five, my, my NES was my constant companion. Um, and I've always really uh, loved the, the, you know, the worlds and the characters of the gameplay of video games. When I started Level 99, I wanted to adapt that, that kind of play to tabletop. And it, uh, it wasn't so explicit in our early days, but now we've come back and made it more of our explicit mission to um, to build games for this uh, for for our generation of players. Awesome! So you're nice. you're basically trying to get a, a video game sense or a feel in a board gaming world, something that Absolutely. yeah, and that and I think that's fair to say that like. Even though you have, like, let's say, Pixel Tactics, which we'll be talking about more in a bit, it has an 8-bit tone to it. It really does feel like, you know, a two-player strategy, like, almost like Final Fantasy Tactics in a way, you know, your positioning goes. Um, so that seems like that was kind of the aim of, the, of that mission statement, wasn't it? Yeah, absolutely. We really want to pioneer some of these genres that haven't come to tabletop yet, and uh, those are our, our plans for the future. Involve bringing a lot more, but so far, fighting games with uh, with Battlecon Exceed and of course Pixel Tactics for the um, the strategy SRPG genre, and um, yeah, we got a few other things in the works too. Awesome, nice. 
Very cool. So uh, me and Daniel will probably be going back and forth on this, but let's go ahead and get started. Uh, we There was 175 listings on Board Game Geek. We opened them up in order as far as Board Game Geek shows, so they might not be in perfect order of release. So we might be talking about ones that were released like a few months after, before, etc. But the first thing that I think is that's worth noting is 2010, BattleCon the Fighting System. Yeah. Yeah, Battlecon War. That was uh, my first project, and I, you know, I saw the board games on Kickstarter were a thing, and I'm like, I could do that. So I took the game that I was currently working on, which was Battlecon War of Indians, and put it up on Kickstarter, and uh, figured it all out <laughs> as we went along. It was a really great experience, and we've met a lot of friends and fans that are still with us to this day, uh, participating in our projects. That's awesome. So you started this off being a Kickstarter pay or a Kickstarter game, wasn't it? Yeah. Well, originally it was um, actually like print and play, free to play. So you could get Battlecon, play it for free, try it out, and then um, you know when that as that got popular, I decided to go into the um, you know and try it on Kickstarter. And uh, yeah, we hit that goal, and it was uh, the rest is history. Uh, and awesome. what's nice about this one is that I'm seeing that you guys weren't nominated for the 2011 Golden Geek Best Print and Play Board Game at that. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's fantastic! I didn't yeah, realize so it was quite quite uh, popular on KMP. Nice. That's awesome. So, what was the deciding moment where you when you decided that uh, instead of just making print and play games, that you wanted to actually make a publishing company out of it? Or, I guess another question that I have for you is that a lot of <gasps> designers. Uh, they sometimes they'll seek out publishers to print their games instead. You went a straight solo mode going into it, you know, no pun intended. But uh, well, it's it actually wasn't the first game made by Brad Talton. Just the first game by Level Ninety Nine. Uh, uh, the first game by Brad Talton is actually a lesser known title, but still in print, called Kill the Overlord by Ape <laughs> Games. And so I actually made that. Um, back in like 2008-2009 days and pitched it to Ape Games. Kevin Bresky uh, purchased the game, produced it, and it has sold through about three print runs of it in the past uh, decade. And that game, like by following, by following that game's progress and being a part of Kevin's workflow, that's how I learned how the industry works and what kind of connections that I would need and what kind of work I would have to do to make it all happen. So uh, I really think of uh, of Kevin Bresky of Ape Games as kind of my mentor in all this, and he, you know, really taught me about the industry and got me on board with it. That's awesome. Have you made any other games for him after that, or was that the one? We were trying to do a licensed game as a popular first-person shooter, but uh, ultimately it fell through, and we didn't make the game. And at that point, I showed him on the way back from that, who went to pitch it at the video game studio, and they loved it. But their their publisher wouldn't let them sell the license. Uh, but anyway, on the way back from there, I showed him Battlecon, and I was like, "So do you want to do my next game, Battlecon?" And he's like, ah, "I don't think this is right for our audience." <laughs> so I had to do it myself, and uh, and here we are. <laughs> right. Wow, that's that's fantastic. Yeah, um, it's pretty neat. Yeah, definitely. Now, I also noticed that one of the artists, the first name that pops up, there's about seven or eight artists listed for Battlecon, but I see Fabio Fontes. And the reason I bring up his name is because you're still making games with his art, isn't it? Aren't you? Yeah. yeah. We still are working with Fabio. Most recently, he's been working with Josh on Millennium Blade's Collusion. Um, and now that that's finished up, we're just looking for the next project for us to work together. But Fabio is working on his own game on Patreon, uh, which, if you're interested in that, it's a gorgeous-looking game. It's called Dunkare. It's a... Um, uh, Gosh, what do I say? It's uh, it's a platform action game um, about these uh, forest animals that live in this medieval style kingdom. Um, super, super good looking, super cool game, and uh, Fabio's put a lot of work into it. So I definitely recommend checking it out if you haven't seen it yet. It's well, cool. you kind of won me over with that de description because my wife likes those kind of animal style, human like games. It's very, it's very red ball. Yeah, that's very awesome. Mouse and you said it was called Don't Care? It's D-U-N-K-H-E-R. Don't Care. Uh, okay. But um, I think I think that 
Fabio didn't care what the name was, and he named it Didn't Care because he didn't care. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the joke, at least. That's fantastic. <laughs> oh, man. So we're going to be going into BattleCon uh, a little bit more here in, uh, later in the video. But yeah, so a breakdown of how the, the system works, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, because I do actually own BattleCon. Basically, you have two cards, a left and a right card. Um, I forget what the specific terms are. But you play them together to make your character have a speed, an attack value, and it's essentially a two-player like fighting game, like you would see like Street Fighter, Mortal Kombat, any of those classic video yeah. games. And the cards that you combine together uh, will determine how fast you move, how hard you hit the opponent, or and or if you stun them or apply other effects to the other character. Is that a mm -hmm. pretty yeah, that's a pretty accurate description of the uh, of the core mechanics of BattleCon. And then I guess probably the the other important thing is that each character has their own kind of unique subsystem within the game. And so one character can change forms, another character can um, has a pet that works with them, another character might have different elemental stances they can use, etc, etc. It changes with every single character, and so because of the interaction of these sub-mechanics, every game is going to be a little bit different. That's awesome. And I, I feel like this is going to be kind of a running theme that we're going to be talking about here in a minute. Um... <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and and you will will explain why. How many characters do you have for the for the BattleCon system, give or take? There are just over a hundred now. Ooh. With the introduction of or with BattleCon Unleashed, which will be coming this fall. That's awesome. Okay. A little over a hundred. Yeah. You know, it's it's been ten years, so we've been working on them at a pretty steady pace. That that's still about there ten are, a year. Like that's that's roughly one a month. Give like very rough math, obviously. Yeah. But there's um there's been six core games in BattleCon. Yeah, War, Devastation, Fate, Trials, Wanderers, five core games. Wow. Uh, so yeah, quite a lot, and then tons of standalones, solo fighters. Yeah, like the. Uh... All of the add-on packs, the different characters, and mini expansions, stuff like that. Yeah, it's. I mean, you're you're not kidding when you say that this is a whole universe of uh, the universe of endings. You know that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there's plenty to choose from. All right, we're gonna jump ahead now. We're gonna go to uh, the micro games collection. Now, I, I was familiar with the mini game library, mm -hmm. but. When I was looking over the Board Game Geek thing, I never heard of any of the Micro Games collection. So the Micro Games collection was actually a stretch goal for the minigame library. And if you back the minigame library, you got library, which was six games in one box. You got this envelope, and in the envelope were the Micro Games, and they were games that fit on a single postcard, like a large eight and a half, like a, basically a half letter postcard, front and back. Um, Complete Rules. A lot of games by Daniel Solis. Uh, I did a couple. Um, I got a James Ernest in there. Um, we got um, uh, what's it? Uh, one by John Parmalee, the creator of Power Play. Um, actually, two by John. So all kinds of games that uh, that fit onto those postcards. Uh, it was pretty cool. It was uh, you know it was a pretty neat little promotion. But it was sort of a sub promotion of the mi mini game library. Gotcha. Yeah, I mean, I, I like that idea that it everything can fit on a postcard. I've seen that only a few other times after that, and a few other times before. But how, what was the response for these? Um, I would say it was pretty good, but because it was a free giveaway item, people didn't really seek it out. Um, there wasn't as much buzz for it as there was for the mini game collection. Right. So then let's jump into the mini game collection. Uh, I wanted to bring up the Deep Space Prospector. That was the micro game that you made, right? Yeah, that's the one. All right, cool. Yeah, and then so if you want to yeah, take you, a look you more just into that, throw a handful of change on the table, and it creates this universe that you can fly around and you know and uh, mine for resources. Oh wow! So it's a pick up and deliver. Yeah, it's a pick up and deliver that uses your um, your yeah basically a jar of pennies and quarters and times and nickels to uh, to create your universe. Okay, that's kind of cool. Yeah. So, is this a game, like a collectible game, where the richer you are, the better you are? <laughs> no, I'm... no, just the bigger, the bigger your shared universe is. Gotcha. <laughs> All right. 
Uh, Daniel, why don't you start us off on... I have another picture here for the viewers at home of the micro game collection. Uh, Daniel, why don't you start by talking about uh, the mini game library, and you can pick any of those games that you want to bring up. All right, so the mini game library, there's, from my understanding, there's six games in them, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the one I am familiar with, the one I've played, uh, is the Pixel Tactics. Um, yeah, so, which, which went on to become its own yeah. series with almost ten entries in that series. And including uh, one we were going to talk about a little bit later, which is the Mega Man. That has me intrigued. I have played like the first run of the Pixel Tactics and really enjoy it. Can you describe it for us? Yeah, so the basics of the game are there each card in your deck. So you and your opponent both have the same deck. But each card has five ways that can, it can go into play. At the start of the game, you pick one of these guys to be your leader, and they get some big power that changes everybody in the unit. The rest of your characters either go into the front row, the middle row, or the back row. And when you play a character, the row you play it into determines what power it has. You can also play somebody from your hand for an instant effect, called an order, and then they go away. So it's a one time only. So with those five ways to play, even though you're playing the same deck as your opponent, you really have to be careful All right. Um, so it's very much about adapting the same tools to the different situation that your opponent puts you in. That's okay, very so cool. I, I, I really do enjoy this game. I, I love the art in this game because it does give me that 8-bit feel. It gives me that pixel games I used to play when I played with the, the NES and the SNES. <laughs> yeah, we really, uh, we really love the art that Fabio Fontes did for this game. Was, had he done pixel art before? He had done some pixel art before, and in fact, he did pixel art before uh, this. The pixel art came before the game did. Uh, he was just fooling around one day, and he made all the Battlecon characters in pixel format. And I said, "Hold on, I can make a game with that." And so I took that, you know, that sprite sheet and devised Pixel Tactics, the concept from the sprite sheet. So the art came first in this case. Oh wow! Okay, that's cool. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's awesome. I I remember this was I think probably the very first game. It, it was either this or Battlecon, but I'm pretty sure it was Pixel Tactics was the first game I that I played from you guys. That was my introduction. I know it, it was the first game I played of theirs because you showed it off at the shop. Yeah, yeah. When I moved back, I definitely showed it off, didn't I? <laughs> yep. So I didn't have Battlecon yet. Yet being the keyword, um, yeah. So I have a picture here of the cards. As you can see, you can play it as the order or any of the three positions, or as your leader, which would be the flip side of that. Has a nice gold star. Uh, I mean, that's that's surprising that every card can be played. By it. Talk about multi-use. I don't think I've seen quite that versatility in most games. It's uh, it was a lot of fun to develop. It went through a lot of versions. I think this is the first game that I've done that really, really went through a lot of different changes in its in its core play before. Because uh, it actually originally had a Civ element where you would like collect resources. One of the uses of your characters was as a worker that would accumulate resources for you. And that was eventually scrapped to, uh, to just put everybody on the field doing combat because that was the interesting thing. Gotcha, that makes sense. Now, uh, am I able to bring up your business card? Sure, yeah. Okay. Uh, we and, all have one. Yeah, the, there's something very amazing about uh, Brad's and Joshua's business card is that they are playable cards for Pixel Tactics. <laughs> well, my, mine's playable. Josh is not so much. Mine is playable from a technical standpoint. <laughs> wait, wait. You can put it on the board and it does things. <laughs> you just might not like them. If you use any of its abilities, you immediately lose the game in, in like, four different ways. Oh, yeah, that's cool. Okay. Same with the leader ability as well. Yeah. Wait, wait a minute. What, so what's... Can you explain I, why I was, I was asked to design a PT myself for our older style business cards, and I said, well, if I was playing PT, I would want it to end as quickly as possible. So... <laughs> I, yeah. I got to do some fun, some fun top-down design as far. It's like how many different ways can you actually like lose the game? So it was actually kind of a fun design challenge there. So uh, that's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> then let me let me ask real quick because now I'm just curious. Were are your abilities 
in a way where you're trying like that would just make sure it's your last turn and you're trying to win on that turn or no no, no, no. don't 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 um be fooled and thinking that there's any like strategy involved in, in that car right there like some of the abilities are literally just like spell you lose the game like instantly <laughs> i think i think my leader but he is technically like playable like it's something like uh action mill as many cards from the top of your deck as you want and so you could you could probably do some interesting stuff with that as far but as like, mostly you can just deck yourself but mostly just... you could deck yourself it's, it's the intent <laughs> of that ability wow okay but, uh, you know I, uh, I do i do enjoy constructed pt quite a bit for the record um i actually ended up getting like two or three cards banned when we were testing like pt4 and 5 for constructed yep. purposes so yeah it's uh, pt's been quite the ride man there's, there's so, so many entries in it. it's all over the place yeah so brad i have a question for you mm-hmm. out of the six games that's in the mini game library which one do you feel doesn't get enough love that's a tough question. Um, I think that Master Plan should have been, uh, like, should should get its own standalone box. And we actually developed one, we just never really found the time to print it. So, hopefully we'll get to that someday in the future. Um, I would really like to redesign Blades of Legend and make it good. Um, I felt like the core was good, but the gameplay itself just wasn't all there. And then, um, Grimoire, talk about Grimoire. Yeah, uh, Infinity Dungeon, uh, probably gets, uh, should get some more attention. Yeah, that's about it. That's all I can think of, really. Yeah, How about you, Josh? Grimoire Shuffle. <laughs> I like Grimoire Shuffle. Well, I, I like the concept. I've only played it once or twice, but, uh, I think we could do a lot. Uh, you know, all, so we're pretty involved systems, right? You could do a lot with any of them. Yeah, yeah a lot of them were something. pretty limited by that box, too. Right. Okay. If we made a standalone version of Grimoire, I think it could be really good. Same for uh, for Blades or for uh, Master Plan. Yeah, I'm looking at the on my side. I'm looking at the page for Grimoire Shuffle, and yeah, no, that actually seems like a very interesting game that would uh, be interesting to see it implemented in its own standalone series or at least game itself. Mm-hmm. So let let's explain what what Grimoire Shuffle is, and we'll go to Master Plan right after that. Uh, I see Grimoire Shuffle, Team vs. Team Labyrinth Crawl. Do you mind explaining that a little bit? Yeah, so um, you, it's, it plays to, um, I believe it's four or six players, and the idea is that you and a teammate, uh, or two teammates, are trying to get through this labyrinth, and um, you're, one of you starting on one side, the other starting on the other side, you're just trying to get your characters off the board on the other side. Uh, and the way you do this is by playing spell books. Um, each spell book had, can manipulate the labyrinth in some way. And so uh, sometimes you're playing your books so that you can manipulate for your friends uh, to make it easier, sometimes to make it harder for opponents, uh, sometimes just to move yourself along. Um, and that's pretty much the premise of it. It's, it's quite simple and straightforward to play. The uh, only difficult part is the drafting part, because your team leader determines who gets what books at the start of the round, and that can be very um, can be very intensive uh, mentally to try and figure out how to optimize the books you got. That's awesome. This is one that I that's on my list to play for sure. Yeah, no, I this is, I want to play this one now. All right, well, you sold us on that one. Let's talk about Master Plan real quick, because that was the first one you brought up. How does Master yeah. Plan work? So this is a game show for supervillains, um, kind of like American Gladiators or something. But the, the idea is that you're over this giant pit, and these platforms are rising up, and you're trying to jump across the platforms to get to the final, uh, to the, the treasure at the end, the prize. And, but you, you as the players are the ones placing down the platforms. And each platform has different things about it. Uh, for example, if you flip up one it has a laser ray, then you get to destroy another platform in range. If you flip one over and it's got like a catapult, then you get to move your character in this certain direction, and so forth. The, um, and the, what do I say? Um, yeah, so players are constantly building their own paths while also trying to fake out the opponents. You know, like, I'm putting this down, but it's a trap, don't use it, that kind of thing. 
because I want to actually use it on my last on my next turn. Uh, and it's got a lot of bluffing and a lot of uh, a lot of high chicks. It's a very wacky sort of game. Yeah, that that Would sounds you say like that it's fun. like spelunky with effects, kind of. Um, maybe, maybe. Very cool. Yeah. Now that so it's not just to clarify, it's not dexterity. You're placing the cards like face down in in a modular yeah. board. Um, it's actually it's it's not dexterity, but it is real space. So you place the cards down anywhere you want. The movement that I can make is one card length of movement. So my character can jump this far. The cards can be placed in any arrangement orientation you want. You can even play with like obstacles on the table, you know, like cups, and jars, boxes, and such. And your characters have to get around to these obstacles. Wow, that's really fun. Yeah, I. That's on my want list now. All right. Um, how about we talk about Infinity Dungeon? Yeah, um, Infinity Dungeon is a uh, storytelling game. If you will. It's a bunch of. It's a. Uh, what do you say? You get a character class and a bunch of random items, and you're thrown into this dungeon. And the dungeons always have wacky situations like you know you see the door the exit to this dungeon uh but it's under 30 feet of solid ice and then you know you are you know the the highlander and you have a stuffed moose and a bear trap and a cash <laughs> register how are you going to get out of this <laughs> and those are the kind of uh situations that you have to solve in infinity dungeon and then the other players uh judge your solution uh, depending on that, whether you, you know, what all you did and, and and how plausible they think it is or how entertaining they think it is. And then uh, some dice are rolled and you decide if you uh, win, if you get through to the next room. If you do, then uh, you get through the next room and it's the next person's turn to beat that room. If you don't, then your character dies horribly in some unfortunate accident, which is not very hard to imagine. And then it's the next <laughs> player's turn. <laughs> I like how this is described on BGG as a, a dungeon crawl party game, and that just, it, I, I want to play this just for that reason. Yeah, you don't see many dungeon crawl party games. I, I know of one other dungeon crawl party game, maybe, <laughs> but it's certainly not like this. Wow, that's, that's interesting. Okay, but what was the inspiration behind that one? Brad stepped away for a sec, real quick. Oh, okay, no worries. Okay. His, his daughter. Um, so you're talking about the inspiration for... Uh, Infinity Dungeon. Oh, there we go. You're back. Yeah. Hey, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm home with my uh, my in-laws today, and they're looking after baby for the first time. So. Oh, yeah, <laughs> Always no got a few questions. Yeah, um, if you have to step wait. away, you just give us a holler. That's no problem. Oh, okay, well, yeah, and we have no issue with that. Excuse me for... for stepping out for a sec but i'm back so yeah let's continue on okay um so what was the inspiration be behind infinity dungeon when did you come up with that idea um it's hard to say you know me and uh my friends had always played rpgs and we always liked really wacky rpgs so it was kind of just encapsulating the type of D, &D games we already played uh and then just maybe turning the silliness up a half step or so <laughs> okay, that's that's cool. I like that. Yeah. All right. That that's another. It seems like it's a hit. All right. Uh, the next one I want to talk about is Blades of Legend for the mini games. Yeah. So Blades of Legend is is basically Holy Grail War. The um the what do you call it? yeah Holy Grail War the social deduction game. Uh, if you're familiar with Fate Stay Night the uh, and the the whole Fate series. Uh, the basic idea is that there's a bunch of champions and they got super powerful uh, weapons and abilities, but they're working for um, one of the like, masters of the game. And these players are weaker and easier to defeat, um, but they are the ones that give out uh, power to their minions. So, um, so the way the game works is if you're at the start of each turn, uh, the masters get gather power and then they give it out to all of the wielders who have the blades and then these wielders determine who they're going to support using their special powers and the power that they've received and um, at the end of the round that determines uh, you know which sides make progress which wielders get defeated uh, when the wielders get defeated 
they flip their blades over and they get even stronger. But if all four of your wielders get defeated, then you as a master get destroyed. So you're kind of trying to figure out who the enemy players are and then power them all up so they explode. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. I, I'm lo I love the art and the graphic design on this one specifically. I have a couple of the cards pulled up on my page here so the viewers at home can see. Uh, like the duplicate, the virus, like the, they're all just super wacky. The judge is like a sword with, with the w scale. It, yeah. Yeah, Fabio again did the art for these. Um, did actually all of the mini game library games. Oh wow, yeah, no yeah. kidding. Yeah, that this that was one. The, looks... the start of our beautiful partnership. Oh, was it really the start? Well, he had done um, he had done one character in Battlecon war he did luke von gott and then after that we just kept working together because it was such a great professional to work with yeah That's he cool. he definitely i mean he i would not to compare him with any other artist but like he he reminds me a lot of um there's a uh, vincent Dutrait who not so much in style but the amount of work that he, you're able to pr <laughs> to create in <laughs> such a small amount of time uh which we'll be talking about just that level of of skill when I'm sure when we get to Millennium Blades because that's going to be a talking yeah. point for sure. Um, and so with these games, they all sound phenomenal. But there was one game that I'm purposefully waiting for. Or I wanted to wait for this to be the last one that I ask you about personally, as far as the mini game library, and that would be Noir. Yeah. So um, Noir is a two player, basically two player werewolf set in a black and white film noir universe. Does that okay. sound pretty accurate? I mean, that sounds accurate to me. I don't know who you're asking specifically, but... Um... Oh, yeah. <laughs> but you've, you've, uh, I assume you've played this before. Uh, sure. I've owned a few copies of it, yes. Um... <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I, 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 I have the black box. I'm looking at it on my shelf right now, but I've also owned the mini version. And I think there was... Uh, you made a BGGCon version. I think I used to own that one as yeah, well. Yeah, back in 2013. Yeah, and so so I'm a man of abstract strategies. I, I love this. The, this just hits on a lot of really good cylinders as far as everything's out in the open, but everything is also completely hidden. And you progress yeah. the game where every time you make a judgment or you kill somebody... Well, that's one less character you can hide behind, potentially. It's it's a really, really neat game. I, I love this. It's it, it, I wouldn't say it's a social deduction, but it's definitely a logical deduction game. Uh, yeah. The, I, I, I dig this one a lot. I could rant for days about it. Um, it is available on Board Game Arena to, to play and try if you'd like to do that as well. Yeah. It's... Um... It's, it's one of the classics. I think it's probably our most editioned game. We have, <laughs> like you were saying, those three editions. The, the original minigame library, we did a black box edition. We did a BG edition. I did a wedding edition for my one of my wife's friends. Uh, <laughs> that's got, uh, that's got like all the, the people who are participating in the wedding. Uh, I've got a... We did a, a version with Penny Arcade that uses the characters from Noir, or from Automata. They're um, like dystopian robots uh, subcomic. So yeah, a lot of editions of Noir uh, have uh, have gone out, and it's it's been a really fun game. Uh, it's like it's done uh, it's done well, and it's kind of one of the games that we sort of see as a like an introductory game for level ninety nine. Yeah, yeah, it's it's uh, it's very it's it's a very straightforward game. It only uses like I think fifty cards as the original game, um, and some references. And then you could either play it out as a two-player, but if you get the black box version, there's, like, I think four to eight different modes or something like that? Yeah, there are there's six different modes, one of which goes to eight players. Wow. Yeah, so if you wanted that next level up. Um, yeah, it's it's a fun little game. I enjoy it a lot. It, it works well for my abstract strategy needs. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's go on to... Uh, Daniel, you want to take this one? Champions of Indines? Uh, let me find it on my list over here. Okay. Yes. Champions is actually so a game that we haven't published yet. <laughs> so it was, it was a game we proposed. It was a, ga it was a game that was available print and play for a few months. 
Um, but it was ultimately taken down because we didn't have the time to devote to it fully. So we probably shouldn't talk about it because there's not much more to say than that. <laughs> no worries. And we'll go ahead and skip it on to uh, Seven Card Slugfest. <laughs> My apologies. Yeah. Uh, yeah, what can you tell us about Seven Card Slugfest? So, um, and I can't remember, Josh, th you were working for us already at this point, too, right? We did uh, might have been on the tail end, but I don't remember working on Slugfest personally. Yeah. Well, um, yeah, also we missed Mystic Empyrean, because that won't show up on PGG. Oh, because it's an RPG, right, right. Right, yeah. yeah. Oh, okay, uh, do you want to tell us about that then, real quick? Well, Josh, probably, you can talk about it, Josh. Yeah, sure. So Mystic Empyrean is actually the reason I started working for 99. I, I helped beta test it, and uh, got involved after I graduated college. So uh, Mystic Empyrean is a tabletop role-playing game where the players are Eidolons, are kind of like aspects of nature or kind of like the demigods or whatnot and they go on trying to restore this lost world by uh, going to these remote regions and uh, finding cornerstones that kind of restore the world to what it once was and the amazing thing about it is that uh, it's a role playing game first of all that doesn't have a GM everyone kind of is the game master as you play and uh, the decisions you make, uh, the social uh, things that you do during the game affect how you like level up and gain new abilities. So your character is kind of defined by traits, which are aspects of your personality that manifest into like mechanical. Whereas like if you're hot-headed, you can like shoot fireball in your hand, or if you're like really analytical, you make portals and stuff to go around. And each game, when you finish it, the players kind of assign you trait points based how you acted during the game. And yeah, so, so they your, can level your up existing friends at the abilities. table level you up. Yeah. And they can they level up existing abilities you ever give you new weapons and whatnot. So it kind of like, it's a role system that like helps you role play good. I guess I would say it, it's it's really neat and you know, honestly, I've, I've never seen anything like it before or since. Um, and the other cool thing too is that these corners do you find, not only do you, you all kind of develop your character Oh, the cornerstones you find a lot to add gameplay aspects to the set itself. So if a player finds a cornerstone, they might make an entire new town that they get to make, and then you get to go explore it, session or meet, introduce like a concept so well, like currency or whatever, and now there's this new thing that everybody gets to play with on the next session. So it's it's very much a kind of like RPG maker, the tabletop RPG a bit, I would say. That actually uh, might get me to play RPG, tabletop RPGs. That right, sounds it's, amazing. It's, it's very rules light, too. There's not much, you don't have to read like a seven page book or anything to learn to play it. It's pretty quick to jump in and, and get going. How, is that, yeah. a, it, was that published? Or is that available for sale? Yeah, uh, it's actually not our a second part. Kickstarter project. Yeah. Oh, okay. So it's a little hard to find now. Um, we've had some talks about maybe bringing yeah. it back but nothing concrete yet we uh, but you can download the pdf on drive through rpg mm -hmm. so if you did want to get it it, it is available to you that's right, awesome the, the digital version so you heard it here you definitely go to tabletop R or drive through rpg and get a copy of it and try it that yeah i always i'm always intrigued by i've never been the biggest rpg player but i'm always intrigued by people who make a new system and the the friends leveling you up idea sounds awesome yeah, exactly. Great. Right. It's a, it's a much more interactive experience. It's not a lot of TTRPGs on the market, right? Because you're all you're not only working together to play, but you're working together to advance your characters. Too, yeah. So. The 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 goal is build the or what I'd say the reward is building the world, and the game is playing through the world you build. So it all cycles uh, into itself. That's fantastic. Now, is is that aimed more towards? Uh, RPG players who want a new world, or is that aimed for non-RPG players you're trying to get into tabletop play? It is definitely a game for very experienced players, um, and it says it says so in the book. Like, hey, this is not this is not your first RPG, probably. <laughs> right. Not that you can't, but if if you'll want to have at least one experienced guide in the group to to teach you how it's done. Yeah, or a group full of guides if they're 
Because there's too many of them. <laughs> yeah. You can't have too many GMs in this game. That's fantastic. Cool. All right. Well, All then, right. if there is any other RPGs that, that isn't part of... Uh, I know Power Play is not an RPG, but it's a storytelling game. Um, so if there's any others that don't show up on Board Game Geek, feel free to shout at us and uh, let us know about that, because we would love to talk about those, too. There's technically the Millennium Blades one, but I'll, I'll mention that briefly when we get some Millennium Blades. Awesome. Cool. Nice. Uh, Daniel, you want to take it from here? Uh, so the next game on our list here is Seven Card Slugfest, and uh, I played this once, and I wasn't very good at it. <laughs> well, it's a, it's a pretty different kind of game. It's, it's a real-time barroom brawling simulation. So players are... We're, Working together to, or not working, working against each other, and you, you have everybody's face down on the table, and you have a deck full of punches. Who want to hit? And then at the end of the round, you flip all those decks over and you count down, and whoever did the knockout blow gets the points. So you're all trying to score that knockout on the uh, on the opponent. Yeah, I can never knock anybody out. <laughs> <laughs> It's, it's, uh, it definitely is a bit of reading and a bit of uh, fast play and opportunistic play. Yeah, yeah no. <laughs> I, I enjoyed the game for or when I played it, but I just, I'm not good at those kind of fast play style. No, we've examined a couple ways that we think we could improve that game. And, you know, we'd love to bring it back. And at the same time, there's so much cool stuff we want to do to move forward, too. It's hard to pick which of these projects. I mean, we've already gone through a few of these on memory lane. It's like everything that we talk about. I just kind of want to do a new edition and, you know, <laughs> and make it even better. Right. So we know uh, for you, time is limited. So why don't we jump ahead, Danny, and uh -huh. get to the game that everybody wants to talk about. And let's go to Millennium Blade. All right, let's jump. So we'll do a couple quick shout outs on the way. And if there's anything you want to bring up about it, there is Disc Duelers, which if I'm not mistaken, is a, uh, a disc flicking dexterity game. Um mm -hmm. Very, very super cool one where, of course, players have different abilities. And you're basically uh, battling each other, right? Or, or there's yeah. a bunch of different modes. Yeah, there are a bunch of different modes, but mainly it's a future all arena battler. Awesome. So that's Disc Duelers. Um, Variant Souls uh, that was listed on here. I don't see any comments or ratings, so we'll just go ahead and that skip is, that for now. Yeah, that was a uh, man. We got to talk about Power Play because that was a side project to Power Play. Um, and Power Play, basically, somebody pled, there was there was a $6,000 tier on Power Play, and if you pledged $6,000, we'd print another game, and we'd give it to everybody. Um, and so somebody pledged for that. Variant Souls was the other game. However, uh, later on, the, the the backer who backed for $6,000 proved to be fraudulent. And oh, no. so we weren't able, but we'd already made the other game. So we didn't print it, we just made it and gave everybody the print and play. Oh wow! Okay. Yeah. Very cool. That's well, that's what happened there. That's that's crazy. So that's what Variant Souls was. Um, mm -hmm. let, let's talk about Power Play then. Uh, schemes and Skullduggery. Yeah. Well, that so Power Play was our I guess our worst uh, selling Kickstarter project. Um, well, was it still is, successful? At least. Huh. It was still successful though, right? It was, it, yeah, it was still successful. Um, the second time, we actually had to, re to stop it and restart it because we set our goal way too high the first time. Oh, uh, okay. Um, and, I mean, we really, you know, we weren't a company that was known for narrative games, and we didn't really know what this was or how to market it. Um, and I think that's the reason why it suffered a lot of strife. Um, also, a lot of things we just didn't do the research. Like, the game was originally called Skullduggery, but there's a Robin Lee's game called Skullduggery, and we got CND'd by the publisher. Oh, no. <laughs> so we had to change the name of our project halfway through. Um, and at that point, we were already way behind, so we just said, hey, we're just going to make a new a new title and uh, and relaunch the project under a different name. And then um, the artist, our artist, Danny Hirajeta, quit halfway through the project. And so we had to ask Fabio to do the rest of the arts in Danny's style which is always a difficult thing to ask for, for one artist to mirror another one. Um, right. So the game faced uh, untold challenges. It was a extremely trying project. But in the end, you know, it came out and we delivered it. And it has some uh, some cult fans. 
there are only a few copies of it left in print uh, that aren't sold. I think we have about 20 copies left in our stock, and then it'll be gone. Um, we have to decide what we want to do with it next. Yeah, yeah it, it's definitely a different model going from Kickstarter because... Uh, like some companies, you know, they'll they at a certain point they automatically reprint whatever games it is. You guys have to make that conscious decision every time. I'm sure. For some of these games, yeah, like games like Millennium Blades are just really hard to print without a Kickstarter project. Right. They're exactly. so expensive relative to how much they cost because there's so much content in the box. Yeah, definitely. All right. Well, then let's jump ahead to. Uh, uh, do we want to jump all the way up to Millennium Blades already, and then we'll come back to visit some of these other games? I, I can cover Millennium Blades when we get to it. So. Yeah, Josh is the project lead for Millennium Blades, so he knows more about it than I do yeah. at this point. If you want to cover okay. the older stuff, it'd probably be good to get the oh, yeah, now as well. Brad's still here. Okay. Uh, so then How let's... about we do Argent? Argent. Let's Argent. jump into Argent. Oh, Argent's a fun project. Yeah, so... Like the year after I published BattleCon, the first BattleCon, I went to Board Game Geek Con, and there I met Trey Chambers, and he was uh, working on his Magic School Board game called the Con called the Consortium, and I uh, had already been developing the world of Indians as a, a fantasy world, and Argent was a place that I knew about, you know, was a uh, place that I had, I had put a lot of work into building the you know, the, what do you say, the story, the backstory for this the place. The lore, yeah. And, yeah, and when I saw this this game, Consortium, I was like, oh, that's a perfect fit for the, the world that I've built. Why don't we take Trey's game and World of Indians and put them together? And so that uh, two-year project became Argent the Consortium. And we pitched it the next year at BGG, like we launched the Kickstarter, and then the year after we delivered it. And um, it was it was a really great project. Argent has been a bestseller for uh, over five years now. Um, it's on its third. It's, it's done three reprints and um, has one expansion. We would like to do another expansion in the near future, uh, but we haven't made any solid plans. But that's something that we're asked constantly: is let's get more Argent out there. Yeah. So uh, I'm not gonna lie. I, I do enjoy this game. But the problem for me is I played the first time I ever played this game. It was a five-player uh, first learning for a lot of these people uh, games, and my problem was with the analysis paralysis that happened. So I'm just sitting there like, "Come on, hurry up! It's my turn." Yeah, and and not your analysis paralysis. We have a few buddies of ours who really go into the game, and uh, yeah, which isn't a fault of the the game, right? It's a fault the of the game players, itself. Yeah, but... it's just yeah, the... this, is, this is not a gateway game. By yeah. any stretch of the imagination. I, I remember when... So, I after I had moved away from Albuquerque and moved back to Las Cruces here, I remember I came up, I want to say, like a year or two later and and visited. And I remember I had a conversation with you and Josh and we were talking about different games. I was like, yeah, you know, I, I've, I've enjoyed everything that you guys have made so far, but, you know, I, I, I'm a Euro gamer, true and true. And you're like, oh, wait, you know we have a Euro game now, right? <laughs> and then... Immediately got stopped in my in my turn. I was like, uh, "Go on, <laughs> level 9 I made a made a Euro game. I think this is right after the after you had published it. Um, yeah, yeah. I, that I was through and through, hundred uh, percent into it, and I still have it on my shelf over there. And I somehow added all the expansion stuffs into the ba base box, and it all fits. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, it's a pretty tight <laughs> fit after all that. But now we have two Euro games. Yeah, right? <laughs> well, the next one we'll be talking about very soon, Imperial, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Imperial is also designed by Trey Chambers. Oh, man. So all right. It's in that same genre of adapting you know, traditional Euro mechanics to a uh, wild uh, American-style power set with, uh, with all kinds of events and special powers flying around. And if I remember correctly, Argent is the one that has the shadow mechanic, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That's that's what I actually dug about it was that that ability right there. Yeah, being able to shadow. And I remember, yeah. like, so I I love how some you know non gamers would look at this setup on a table, even for two players, and it covers you know about an eight foot table. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I I love that about the game. You look at it, and you're like, all right, well, so how many players is that play playing right now? Oh, only two. 
It's just me yep. and him. Yeah, that sounds pretty accurate. Yeah, I, I love that. And then so the, at first you would think, it's like, oh, then that's not streamlined, right? But no, it's actually incredibly streamlined. The, the mechanisms are actually really straightforward and solid. You just have... The, if, if there was one game that I would consider close to a sandbox Euro game, this is probably the one. Yeah, it's very sandboxy. Yeah, there's nothing you can't do <laughs> in that one, pretty much. Alright, so, yeah, Argent is fantastic. Um, I'm going to rewind just a little bit, so that way we can talk about Cell Swords. Level 99 Gamer. The one we're getting to, or Argent? Uh, Argent. Oh, good, good, good. Yeah, you said you haven't played Millennium Blade, Blade, so I'm glad to hear that it got better. Oh yeah, sorry, it cut out there for a little bit. Uh, let's rewind a little bit to 2014 and go to Cell Swords. Yeah, Cell Swords. So Cell Swords was submitted to us uh, was a submission. We were trying to do a second mini game library, and we got a lot of submissions. One of those was uh, Cell Swords, and we liked the game's concept, but it wasn't quite there yet. And we spent a long time, uh, probably about half a year. Uh, to a year, just uh, working with the designer to finish the game and, and you know streamline it, make the scoring system uh, a bit more unique, and uh, and in the end we came out with Cell Swords and it was um, it was a pretty pretty good hit. Um, I wouldn't say it's a smash hit, but people loved it and um, it ended up spawning a sequel, Cell Swords Olympus, which uh, which fixed a lot of problems with the original, and uh, yeah. All the, just all around a solid game with uh, with cool artwork by Fabio Funch again, <laughs> and um, <laughs> yeah, so good stuff. Yeah. Um, now you mentioned that I was originally in plans to make a second mini game library. Is that still uh, an idea? Um, it's an idea, but it's not something. Excuse me, it's not something that I think we'll do anytime in the immediate future. Each game takes a lot more energy than uh, than they did back when we were a bit smaller. Yeah. There's uh, there's more to do, and it takes more time. So if we do another mini game library, I don't know when it'll happen. But we've also found that uh, our fans prefer the larger and medium style games. So, you know, Pixel Tactics is popular, but uh, Millennium Blades has, uh, has sold just about as much as Pixel Tactics. Um, so, from a artistic standpoint and from a uh, marketing standpoint, we want to sell and build more Millennium Blades because the game is is gives us more space to work, and it's um, and it's more exciting and impressive to work. Gotcha. That makes sense. Well, speaking of incredibly large games, let's talk about Dragon Punch real quick. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, so I Dragon Punch. Uh, well, go ahead. What were you saying? Yeah, I remember the first time you you brought or you showed me this at a convention. I was talking about micro games, and you said that, uh, and and I hope I'm not stepping over any toes by you saying this slogan. But you said it's love letter, but punching each other. <laughs> yeah, that's that's about that's pretty reasonable. I think that's uh, that sounds about right. So there's actually a series of three games: Resistor, Dragon Punch, and Witch Hunt. These are games that we published but did not develop. So Outside Studios built these games. We just handled the printing, delivery, sales, and promotion for those games. Um, and so all three of those sort of fit that set. And Dragon Punch was the second game that we picked up like this. It's by um, a, a guy named Cohen Hendricks, and he is in the UK. And uh, yeah, he was building this game, and uh, it, was, it was a cool little fighting game. We thought, oh, our audience likes fighting games, so we picked it up, and... Uh, you know, and published uh, published the game, helped him fulfill the Kickstarter project, and um, yeah, and then we took the the rest of the stock and started selling it, and at conventions and distribution, etc. Of those games, uh, Resistor sold out um, and is now out of stock, um, and then uh, Witch Hunt is still selling pretty steadily. Um, and we still have a few of those left, but we're running out of that. And then Dragon Punch um, was a bit of a slower sell, and I think we missed that critical moment where micro games were really hot and everybody was buying them up. Yeah. Uh, so, 
unfortunately, Drag Punch was a little bit late for that, and so we did not uh, sell as well as we would have liked. Yeah, that's fair. I, I remember that a lot. Like uh, that was right around that time, where where it seemed like every company had you know a, at least a few mi- micro games or mini games. But yeah. I my my personal favorite are the I've I've owned both Dragon Punch and Resistor. Resistor is probably my personal favorite. Uh, I just like the two-player hacking theme. That I think that's just a really neat yeah, theme. Yeah, it's a really gorgeous game too. Yeah, and it just looks good on your table. One thing that I really liked about the box is that. Uh, did you have a, a say in how the box was made, or was that already de- developed that way, where it stands uh, upright? Ahead and... of me, but what's that? Yeah, they said they that that was the designer's decision to structure the box like that. But it's a great look. Anyway. Very cool. All right. Well then, let's go ahead and. So we talked about Witch Hunt, Dragon Punch. Let's talk about the big boy. The the biggest game you got here. Millennium Blades. Josh, what can you tell us about it? So Millennium before Blades... We, before Josh gets to that, I need, I'm going gonna, gonna to have to sign off. Okay. Uh, so I will bid you all farewell. And, uh, Brad, thank you for joining us today. Thank you guys for having me so much. And um, I appreciate having us on the show. And I'm sure Josh will uh, will have a great time talking about his latest projects and Millennium Blades as well. Very cool. Yeah, Brad, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, go check out Level 99 Games for, for anything Brad does. He's super active on communities, so if you need to ask him questions, you know how to contact him. Uh, yeah, thank you for joining us, and hopefully once all the virus stuff is gone, I'll have a chance to come up there and visit you guys. Absolutely. Danny, Danny, it's been great. I'll see you guys around. All right, take care. All right, Josh, thanks for sticking with us. Um <laughs> So, Millennium Blades, the probably the biggest game that you guys have have made. Definitely, as far as like weight and volume of product, most, <laughs> most likely next to Battlegrounds, I would say. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So, so I, I am sad to say I have still have not played Millennium Blade. Oh, you should. It's uh, it's quite interesting. <laughs> you know, if you like, if you ever played, if you ever played like Magic or Yu-Gi-Oh or Pokemon, anything, it's definitely like a kind of a gamer's game, I guess you could say. Yeah, and that's not and that's not to assume that this is a collectible card game, or even in that realm. No, it's a collectible, we call it a collectible card game simulator. So, it's a board game that simulates the experience of, you know, going to shops and buy packs and making decks and playing in tournaments and becoming world champ. Now, all the stuff that we wanted to do when we were younger, or maybe right now, but, you know, don't have hundreds of dollars to make the decks or travel around thing, right? So you can do all of that for like eighty bucks in one box in three hours. Yeah. So it, it's like ten years of collecting and competing and like a whole lifestyle game diluted into or not uh refined into the concentrated into like just a two, three hour experience. Right. And mechanically how it works is uh it's it's basically a hand builder. Uh basically you have two phases. You have a deck building phase where you just get a bunch of cards and you can trade them to other players. You can buy new cards and you can sell cards in the aftermarket. And you do is card manipulations to try to make a solid hand of eight cards that you can play during the tournament phase. Once you get to the tournament phase, you play six of those eight cards and they do, you know, different sort of effects on it. It's kind of an abstracted card. When you play a card, maybe it has an effect that happens right there. Well, maybe it's an effect that happens when the certain condition is met. Maybe it has an ongoing effect that it's constantly... And you're trying to generate ranking points or RP. And at the end of the turn, and whoever has the most RP gets victory points based on your placement in that tournament. So you're kind of okay. trying to not only do well... There's tournaments to get our uh, VP. There's other points as well. Like during the deck phase, you can build collections of cards. Like card, all the same type or element in game. P, uh, certain, very rarely certain cards will generate P as well. So there's a couple different things you can do during the whole course into game VP. And you play through three of these tournaments as a full game. So three sets of deck building interfaces. Alright, this this sounds like a fun game. Um, I, I do want to try it. Um, Danny just needs to bring it over. He doesn't bring it Oh, okay. <laughs> well, I mean, in my defense, yeah, I have a reason I haven't brought it over, but one of the best conscious, uh, components like one of the best concepts of how how different level 99 things compared to the average publisher 
So they include paper money, which immediately, when you say that, would make you cringe. However, the way they implemented it had stickers that were bands that would go around packs of money. So you're throwing around <laughs> stacks of bills. Yeah, around. you literally throw around like, giant wads of cash to like buy a card. <laughs> okay, that's awesome. Yeah. Um, I want to get into this real quick that you guys won the 2016 Cardboard Republic Immersionist Laurel. Um, also, this game was nominated for the Golden Geek Best Card Game, Best Thematic Board Game, and Most Innovative Board Game. And won the 2016, or was a finalist for the 2016 Golden Elephant Award. Mm. Yeah, it's uh, it's gotten a lot of numbers and whatnot, probably just because the design is so weird and innovative. I guess you would say. Yeah. Yeah, it does something that I don't think I've ever seen. I you know, I haven't seen it. a board game do. Which one? Uh, Millennium Blades, right? You know, I don't really yeah. see it, like board games that play off the, the. You know, there are a lot of like magic clones and stuff. You know, it's a game about summoning monsters and then you fight each other. But there's no, like, I haven't seen games that are like, hey, it's about playing a card game. Like, that's the experience as you're, you're playing, quote, Yu-Gi-Oh! or quote, Pokemon or whatever in this gameplay space. Yeah. Yeah, at, that is a really unique theme. At every review I've seen of this has been praising it. Like, I even like, like, so much to the idea, I remember when you were explaining this to me, it's when you buy a booster pack of cards, you don't... You only want one card out of that pack, of course. You're going to go for the rare card. So you did that. You designed each of the backs of the cards to look like booster packs. <laughs> yeah, so when you when you buy packs from the store, they're actually all face down. And all you can see is what set they're from and what the type and element combinations of the card are. So you can kind of get an idea of what the set gives you, especially if you played the game a bunch. You kind of know what's in the set, but you don't know what you're going to get until you buy the card. And that's why there's so much manipulation, right? You're you're over the course of a deck building phase, you're going to buy like tens of cards with your money, and then you have to figure out what to do. Do I want to put them in my deck? Do I want to put them in a collection? Do I want to try to trade them to some else? You have all these different things you can do with these cards. Uh, and that's kind of the the interesting part of the deck phase is that it's we we design it specifically so that it's so much to do that you will not have time to like sit there and parse everything right you just have to make decisions and live with the consequences <laughs> and you know as you play multiple games you'll kind of get into that groove of like oh it's that set i know what that set does and you kind of learn as you go okay i i, I do need to try this i'm not gonna lie um this has been on my want to play list we just haven't got it to the table mm -hmm. yeah uh, do you have an estimate of how many cards there are in the game I know there's an... Uh, yeah, I have an almost exact number because of collusion. It's uh, it's approximately, uh, two thousand. I believe it's 2,360 some odd cards uh, with collusion once it comes out. So literally thousands of cards. Jesus. <laughs> uh, only some of them are duplicates. So every set is kind of... Uh, every set is like a 12 set and each set has a couple copies of each card. And yeah, one no, copy just... of the rare one. <laughs> just the fact that there's over 2,000 cards when the, the newest expansion comes out is just amazing. Yeah, the base game itself has like six or 700 of those cards, too, so... Yeah. Even just with the base game, you have quite a lot of replayability. Yeah, I, you, you realize that in making a meta game about collectible card games, this has more cards than most collectible card games have ever so gotten. So that's actually kind of a, a bit of a problem during development that we run to, especially in conclusion, is that when you kind of just a card game, you essentially design a card game. So, like, Millennium Blades has, like, a rules FAQ thread that's, like, 40 pages long on board. It just because of all these, like, really weird niche card actions, like, you know, when you play this card, this card, how do they act and stuff? And it's not really something we put... You know, we, we thought about it during development, but as we made more or mini expansions and full expansions, it's kind of become this, you know, nightmare of rules actions. <laughs> no, what you I know, find which funny is, about... you know, thematic, of course, so that's fine, I guess. <laughs> uh, what I find funny about Millennium Blades is uh, not the fact that they have more cards than uh, collectible card games, that this has been lasted longer than some collectible card games lasted. Yeah, yeah. like their yeah, lifespans. I, I have, like, 
I, I, I'd like to collect old, defunct, collectible card games. So I have, like, Anachronism, the Looney Tunes card game, Tomb Raider. And, yeah, you guys have, have beat it in a non-collectible form. Kind of, like, making fun of the idea. It, it's so, so great. Right. What, what you guys achieved with that is absolutely phenomenal. So, um, then we'll jump through, like, some of the bigger ones. And then, uh, real quick, because now time we're going a little long on this but thank you for telling us about millennium blades uh, yeah. there's a quick one that that will bring up it's called i can't even with these monsters right uh so i can't even was designed by an outside designer kind of like uh uh the other games you mentioned previously uh, spell swords and whatnot um if i can God, i have too much with the develop that that was that was one uh like dragon punch that we published Oh, okay. uh, we didn't actually design it, so we took the design. It's, if I remember right, it's a, uh, it's uh, has a math element to it. You're playing these cards. I believe it's press your luck, uh, a bit, and you're trying to add up these numbers. You have character powers like these different monsters that kind of affect how your math works when Very you cool. play. But uh, I don't remember how well that did actually. Like, I don't know what it did super well. I think it's still in print, so uh, you can always check out our webpage too for more information. Very cool. Get a copy if you like. That's awesome. Thank you for telling us about that. Yeah, I showed yeah, sure. uh, Daniel Solis made made that design. Right, right, Daniel. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's talk about Exceed. Um, now, right. I remember when this was originally told, or when you guys told me about this Exceed. It's basically, in a way, a refinement of BattleCon. In a way, right? It's like a reworking. That was what it was originally, so we kind of took Battle Comp and then we streamlined it a lot, and then we streamlined it more, and then we streamlined it more, and we ended up with Exceed, which is, I feel, a significantly different kind of system from Battle Comp. It has similar kinds of features, you know, you have range, you have power, you have speed, and stuff, but the way it plays, you know, you have a deck of cards, you don't have perfect information, and, and your cards have boosts, so you can do, like, little bonus effects during turn and whatnot, you know, your character cards are actually on the board on this 2D dimensional plane. But, uh, yeah, it's kind of a, kind of the next step from BattleCon, I would say. A much more streamlined, uh, quick and easy version. Yeah, yeah, because I know, like, you don't play, like, a left and right card, you play just, uh, one single card. Right, you just play a card that has similar types of stats, right? Cool. Yeah, I, and we'll, we'll come back to Exceed here in a bit, but I wanted to bring up that it was brought, brought in 2016, uh, went with like the Red Horizon theme. I remember. Yeah, this. so that's Jasco Games' uh, IP that they use for the uh, Universal Fighting System. Uh, what was then Universal Fighting System? What is now Universes, I suppose. Oh, okay. And, uh, you know, it's gotten a lot more sets since then. We've gotten Street Fighter. We've gotten Shell Fight. We've gotten Future Seasons that I cannot legally talk about on this call. Which we won't, but of course. Very exciting that we might be announcing soon. Yeah. So. But, um, Let's bring up the fact that, so I, I had uh, Street Fighter Exceed brought up, um, but I also have another page for uh, Mega Man Pixel Tactics, which is also a co-deal with Jasco, right? right? with Jasco. Mm -hmm. So how did that work? Uh, you guys are both two very, fairly different companies as far as production. How did you yeah, guys get together? Um, from what I know, Brad's very good friends with Jason, uh, one of the people that runs Jasco games, and... Uh, Jasco gets a lot of licensed products as well. You know, they have the Mega Man board game, and they have uh, Cowboy Bebop board game Boogie and whatnot. So they have a lot of different anime licenses and whatnot they get to draw from. And so uh, I I don't remember exactly how that talk went. I think I think we hit them up, but maybe they didn't. Uh, uh, however it happened, but we ended up uh, kind of borrowing the Mega Man license from Jasco and making PT with it. And so, but you know, both Texas Axe and Exceed are kind of systems designed for this IPification. I, you know, you can take in a lot of things like Mega and then easily just apply it to how Pixel Tactics works. You know, you have all these robot masters and and whatnot that you can just play on the field and they do different things. A lot like PT. Same with Exceed. You know, we developed a fighting system. That's kind of what we want to see differently from Battlecon. It's a system that could adapt to the You know, if we could get Street Fighter, if we could get Shovel Knight. You know how would those play in the system and so it's been pretty successful i would say so far yeah that's awesome I would say so. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I, my son is a huge Mega Man fan. Um, so much to the point where we ended up getting him a copy of the board game. Um, but yeah, I mean, I this is a game that I'd be more in tune to wanting to play. Mm-hmm. So that that's awesome. Um, right, and it's so compatible with all the other PTs as well. So you you can start with it or play it later, and you can still combine with other PT games. And, oh, wow. So it's it's not a reskin. You actually develop... You have to sleeve them. The backs are, are different because of licensing uh-huh. things. But if you sleeve them, you are, they're completely cross-compatible. Wow, that's okay, fantastic. Kind of cool. Yeah, what? so you can play a med- deck against a PT1 deck or whatnot, and that's fine. Cool. That That's fantastic. So, I mean, I would love to play, you know, a, a normal knight, you know, and, and a, a standard leader versus, or even your character versus Mega Man. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, like, you can have me fighting Mega Man if you really want to. <laughs> now that you mention it. No, uh, so we're going to we're gonna talk about some of the small games real quick. Uh, I have one here called... Uh, it, Card Fusion Chaos was an expansion for... Was that an expansion for Millennium Blades? I see Millennium Blades. So, so Card Fusion Chaos uh, actually isn't out yet. Okay, then um, we'll skip that. It was a game that we were working on around the time, around the first expansion from Millennium Blades Separation, but it didn't really go anywhere yet. It's kind of something we're, you know, backburnering okay. right now, but uh, you might see it in the future. Um, there is another mini game that came with separate. I forget the name. Uh, a little, a little packaged card game that comes in separation that you can play though. Is it? And it's kind of like a, a meta meta commentary. It's like a card game within a card game. A card game with type of thing. It. So I see another one called Ballistic Rain. Is that a? Is that what you're talking about, or is that? Ballistic uh, Rain. No, 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 no. Ballistic Rain actually also isn't out either. Okay. That was another uh, project that we uh, haven't really done much with yet. Okay. Um, so, not really too much to say there. Well, no. Yeah, it is a set in um, Millennium Blades, though. We did make a set with the, the art from that. Oh, that's cool. Okay. So, yeah. if you want to see, like, a teaser kind of thing, that's that's there. That's there. Cool. Um, now, this is one that I am familiar with, Tomb Trader. Tomb Trader, right. So, Tomb Trader is kind of in the same vein as the Cells, where it's an outside designer uh, that we kind of picked up that, and a non-C, you know, as well. They were both kind of developed at about the same time, or, you know, finished production, I should say. Yeah, Tomb Trader is this really, really quick uh, game where you're a bunch of, like, arc, which is kind of like all the Indiana Jones, go this temple, and it's kind of crumbling around you, and every room you enter has different types of treasures, but you have to uh, pick which room you go in, and then you have to fight amongst whoever else in that room to divvy up the treasure before the timer runs out. And if you don't slide, then the room gets buried and you get nothing. <laughs> so it's this really, really cutthroat, fast-paced kind of uh, social trading game. Yeah, I love Plays that. in like, I think, three minutes or something ridiculous. Yeah. So. Yeah, it's it's obscene. I remember it was like one or one minute or thirty second rounds, and I remember playing this, and I I adore it because I love that live negotiation where it's like, well, no, I I want just this item. Well, you're not gonna get it. Well, then nobody's getting anything, and I'll just sit back and watch you all die. You know? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. So it's it's a really interesting kind of right because yeah, you can't just sit there and, and stone all because then no one will get anything. And, yeah. And there's like five or six rounds, so if you stone all too much, you're you're just going to lose. Right? Yeah. So you have to figure something out. With the other people in the room. <laughs> yeah, this, this one's good fun. Daniel, is this one that you might consider playing? It is negotiation. I, I would consider playing it. The one I want to play is the other one he mentioned, and Anasasi. Oh, Anansi, yeah. I, so, Anansi is a trick taking game. That's uh, why I want to play it. <laughs> right. So, it's a trick taking It's kind of a, you know, it's very level nine. Right? It's a trick taking game, but with power. So, the suits kind of give you powers as you play. And depending on the active suit, you know, kind of different. It's a pretty straightforward trick taking game. It's kind of just a little, a little neat little spin on, on trick taking game. So if you like them, Danny, you know, you would probably like Anansi as well. Yeah, I I I like trick taking games a lot, and I know Daniel, him and I are, we we always are impressed with trick taking games, uh, when they're done differently. You know, not like it's like a a spade reclone, but yeah, yeah, I mean. Th- Trick taking with powers just sounds amazing. 
Uh, does this play... How many players does this play? Three, Three to eight. Okay. Wow, that's a wide range. So, Daniel... Yeah, I, I play up to quite high player counts. Yeah. So this might be one of the games that I have to pick up on my uh, pickup. For sure. If I can find it, I'm going to buy it. Do you know if this is available for sale, Joshua? Uh, I believe we have some copies. I don't think our print run is completely sold out yet. Okay. Well, then, that's so, right, should be some in our online store. Actually, check that. <laughs> ah, yeah. No worries. We're talking. We will jump ahead here as well. Um, so this one does have a few ratings. I'm trying to avoid the ones that are obviously empty. Uh, Temporal Odyssey. Right. So Temporal Odyssey was designed by uh, Crystalis, um, and that is a it's a game where you're a bunch of time travelers trying to like rebuild the timeline and uh, keep everything stable. And so you have this, uh, you have these past, present, and future decks that you draft from. And each deck has different sets of uh, creatures and, and people and what you can enlist to, to help you. So, and they each have different mechanics, kind of like sets in one. It's, and so as you play at the end of each turn, you're drafting new uh, people to fight for you and you play them on the field and it's a fairly standard well you know it's it's kind of like it's kind of like different pt actually is a good but if you like pt you definitely like this game i would say it's a pt but a little more streamlined right you don't you know you don't play in positions to play them to you play them on your field but they still have effects and whatnot so you know as you play you're, you're summoning this big arm dudes and you're trying to destabilize your opponent's timeline by, uh, you know, hitting their health and whatnot. So no. that's actually, Tempar is getting a remake from uh, Solus Games to so like Chris has his own game company now, and uh, he's working on a, a new version of Temporal for the second edition. It's coming oh, okay. out, I think, 2021. So if you like Temporal or you buy it and check out, you know, you can hit up Solus Game Studios and check out the new version coming out. Very cool. It was, Now, forgive me if I'm wrong, but does Crystalis also work with uh, you guys as far as like um, Exceed? Uh, so he worked with us on some Portal and he worked with us on uh, Shovel Knight Exceed, so Season uh -huh. 4. Uh, oh, but okay. now he's doing his own thing. Okay. So he's yeah. doing, yeah, he's doing a Frenemy Pastry Party right now, which is on Kickstarter. That's a fun little Taiwanese game that they're localizing. That's very cool. Yeah, I, I had the uh, a brief opportunity to meet him last year when he was showing off Exceed down here in El Paso. And, uh, oh, yeah, he's a super great guy. Yeah, yeah, definitely very friendly. <laughs> and I, I felt bad for him. He was still somehow able to teach me and a friend of mine Exceed while while about 12 other people were constantly like picking his brain on the, and like drawing his attention away, and he was able to manage it like beautifully. It was, so props to Chris. It was, it was really neat meeting him like that. <laughs> Right, that's pretty impressive. Yeah, definitely. yeah. Alright, um, the next game I have on here is Professor Treasure's Secret Sky Castle. Right, uh, so Professor Treasure was another outside design, like Cell Swords. Uh, it was originally called Tinker Tailor. Um, and that's a, it's kind of a tile placement game where you are laying out, you, you lay out these tiles in the castle, and then you lay out the, uh, you each get a set of rules that are identical, like thief and fighter and whatnot. And you assign them in piles, and those are kind of your turn structures. So you make a little pile of two or three rolls, and on that turn you play those two rolls to the sides, at, to the sides of the castle, and they have numbers on them that resolve in a specific order, and that's how their effects resolve against each other, right? So both ones resolve in an order, and then both twos resolve. And in that way you're kind of trying to loot this castle uh, of all of its riches and whatnot, but you need keys to chests, so you can't just get chests, you need to also get keys and whatnot, and you can get artifacts that give you less points, but you don't need keys for it, so you're kind of trying to figure out how to finagle these different kinds of effects in a way that will benefit you, but also interact uh, with the opponent, right? So if you think your opponent's going to go for this chest, you can play certain kinds of effects to like try to interrupt them, but since everything's played face down and revealed, at the same time, you kind of have to do guesswork, right? Based right. on what they have from previous rounds, you know, where you want to place things. 
So it's a quick little little strategy game that's pretty fun, I think. Yeah, I definitely love the uh, the name of it. Oh yeah, so that name, uh, Brad and I were at Gamma uh, three or four years ago when we came up with the name. We were just sitting in a Las Vegas food court trying to figure out how to, uh, because as you, this is an outside design, we wanted to theme it to fit level 99 a bit more, and we were thinking of a lot of like old school Sierra video games and whatnot with those ridiculously long titles, <laughs> or you know like Carmen San Diego or whatnot. So we want to kind of start this little like micro IP where there's this you know world somewhere with this guy literally named Professor Treasure that is just doing all this ridiculous you know cartoonishly evil stuff like stealing every treasure in the world or something like that. <laughs> so uh, you might yeah uh, we haven't planned anything else for. Yeah, but you might see them pop up uh, eventually if we have another game we think fits that kind of idea. Sure. That's cool. Cool. All right, uh, Daniel, why don't you take the big boy? The, the problem, actually, no. Weight wise, I I know content wise, of course, Battle Con and Millennium Bra Blades are there, but component wise, am I wrong in saying that this is probably your biggest one? And that would be Imperial Spells and Steam. Oh, Imperial. I actually, I, so I played Imperial quite a bit, but I wasn't too in with the development of that. I was working on Collusion at the time. Brad handled, Brad and Laura handled most of that. Uh, but Imperial Spells and Steam is a, it's a train game, you know, pick up and deliver type of game. But, you know, since it's level 99, it's all powers, right? You know, it's, it's set in the world. Of in, it's everybody has magic and stuff. So you're kind of, you know, Establishing these train networks with magic across the world, scenes, and uh, there's lots of powers and whatnot not to help. Wait, so it's not just you know place a train, move you know to the to the home city. You know you do these like neat powers, and you have this big rondelle of spell cars that you place. So you place these uh, types of spell backs on your rondelle, and as you move along on your turn, you choose where to move your station master, and where you end up is the set of effects you act. The turn. There might be things like placing tracks, it might be things like getting mana to power your spells, it might be blowing up another opponent's car on the track. And kind of the, the management of Andel is is how you really play the game, right? Which spell cards you put into your engine, like literal engine effects here, and when you decide to cash out at the end line and pick up goods and deliver them is kind of the core uh, gameplay. Okay, yeah, I, I, I have to try this one. This one actually looks quite fun. Have you played it, uh, either of you? I, have, I haven't. I haven't yet. yet, no. I I was incredibly intimidated by the size of it. Uh, because it, I it saw... It is probably the biggest product we've made as far as a singular product. So the box is huge. It's like maybe even 20. I don't remember how big. It's gigantic. It's meant to hold all, everything, so it's kind of a storage box. Solution right. to you, so you can fit all of the expansions in it as well. Yeah, if I'm not mistaken, that the the large deluxe box, deluxe box, it's about the the width and the length of it is about the same as a ticket to ride size, but so is the height. So it's basically a cube. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's quite the monster. It's kind of one of our first forays into like excessive production quality. You know, there's a lot of games out right now, like Gloomhaven stuff, that have lots of miniatures and really these components, and so. With a with a game style like Imperial, that's this very classic, you know, train game pick up and deliver type of gameplay. We wanted to, you know, really go all out and make like really nice components and nice trains and, and box and whatnot. And so, you know, if you get the deluxe edition, you have all these like really really fancy components that really elevate the gameplay. Yeah, just that whole immersion into it, huh? Right. 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 Yeah, no, this is one, uh, speaking to my Euro side, you know, I, I got to try this at some point in the future. And it looks like, you know, it, it doesn't look difficult to, to play, really. It, no, it's, it's a really quick game. It plays in like an hour. Wow. Like, your, your wow. turn is literally move your Station Master to further along your rondelle and then do what that space says on your rondelle. And then when you get to the end line, that's when you pick up and deliver. You check your tracks and you cash out what resources you have certain spaces to score VP. But the turns are super quick. You can do a turn like five seconds, like no problem. Okay, that's pretty cool. For a big game like this to, to play real quickly is amazing. Mm -hmm. That's Definitely. awesome. 
All right, well now we are, that, that pretty much covers everything that you guys have more or less printed, unless I'm mistaken. Uh, uh, that's most, that's definitely all the, the high points and, and whatnot. You know, there's, there's probably a couple other really small things in there that we might not have hit, but I think we hit most of them. Awesome. Yeah, so then we're going to talk about one more project that's in the works right now. Um, and by in the works, I mean it's live on Kickstarter. And we want to give you guys some time to promote this, of course. Now, I have played it. Um, full disclosure, I have not been paid to promote it in any way, but I have played Bullet uh, with you on Tabletop Simulator, and this this is I mean I'll, this is your first game, Josh. Uh, yeah, well, through first, level ninety nine. Full right, Collision was my first full time as lead developer, but mm -hmm. that's an expansion, so. Right, but you know, this is Bullet's your my design. First, like, main base board game. Right. Kind of experience. And so far, as of when we're recording right now, 2,869 backers, 16 days left, uh, and 151,000 so far, so three times the goal. Uh, what do you want to tell us about Bullet? So, Bullet is a shoot 'em up board game, kind of like to Project or Ikaruga or Space Invaders, that type of uh, video game style play in a board game. Uh, it's a very quick 15 minute game where. Uh, taking these bullets that have color numbers, you're putting them into your site, and then you're using your actions to kind of manipulate them around the board, and you're using your patterns, which are different configurations of shapes, to kind of remove bullets from your site and send them to your opponent. That's awesome. Uh, That's cool. Yeah, no, so Daniel, you haven't gotten a chance to play it yet, but I mean... No, in, I haven't. In a, in a way, you're, you are mitigating these bullets uh, in a nutshell, and and correct me if I'm wrong, Josh, the idea is that you have bullets numbered 1 through 4. You're going to be placing them onto your board based on their numbers. So it, if you draw 3, you put it 3 spots down. But if there's already bullets there, it skips over those. So it starts accelerating and going closer and closer to you. The farther down your board, the more dangerous it more or less is. Because if it gets all the way down to the bottom, that's a hit against you. And each character has different ways to manipulate those bullets and either get rid of them, send them to the opponents, or just mitigate them and put them in a better spot so that way they can deal with it. And so the the core of the game is you're trying to mitigate it uh, like just an onslaught of chaos as it gets more and more and more, and you're trying to just like outlast everybody. <laughs> right, so it's, it's got this presser luck element, right, of place these bullets, you know, based on their colors and numbers your board, but you have like a ton of mitigation, right, between your actions and your unique build, your patterns, you have plenty of time. You can stop your placement. You don't have to place everything at once. You can place some and then, you know, kind of move stuff out of the way, or try to get rid of some, and then continue placing. You just have to make sure that your bag is empty before you can end your turn. So, but, uh, like not you said, lie it kind to, of ramps up as you play. Not gonna lie to our viewers or listeners, I've already backed this game, so... <laughs> yeah, we should play a game after this. It's, it only takes, like, 15 minutes, so it should show you how it works. Yeah, uh, I just don't have a tabletop uh, board game simulator. Um, oh, I can just share screen with you or something just to give you an idea. Okay. Uh, yeah, no, so I've, I'm have i really interested in this uh, just by the description and the way Danny describes it and you. Uh, I was like, okay, I'm going to have to back it. And sure enough, while we were discussing, uh, I think it was one of our other podcasts we were when we were discussing this game, I went on my phone and backed it right then and there. <laughs> oh, nice. <laughs> yeah, that's Appreciate a good sign. It. Yeah, it's 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 super fun, you know. And, and what I think this has a really good benefit to it, uh, it it has three really strong points. First off, the style of game it is is very much akin to something that like Ameritrash games would be, right? Like you imagine, it's like you're you're shooting each other, you're beating stuff up. You have this, but then it also appeals to a Euro game player. Like, how am I going to mitigate these resources that are constantly coming that I don't want? And I got to get rid of them in the most efficient way possible. But then, as you've described it to me as well, you have a number of different characters in the box that are not just a different starting ability or a different ability throughout. No, they're drastically different as per level 99 style. Um, do you want to tell us about some of the characters? Yeah, so, you know, like you were saying, one kind of play. The, the goal for, for Heroines and Bullet is that everyone you pick kind of lets you experience the game in a completely different way. So you have, you know, you have really basic characters that have, like, like a bigger hand is or different kinds of actions, but then you get into some really great stuff, like you have uh, characters that have, like, 
crosshair sights that they can manipulate on their board to kind of shoot bullets in specific configurations. You know, there's like a ghost girl that literally pushes bullets off of her board. So instead of using it's like match configuration, she literally just shoves them off the side of the board to clear them. Uh, there's a character that plays like a sliding block puzzle where she has a little marker herself and you push bolts around like an ice puzzle and you have to use her to block where they go to set up your configurations and whatnot. So there's all kinds of like crazy ways you can experience the system beyond just the basic gameplay. So when you pick up a character, you kind of like get a fun new game you get to play. And uh, should we talk about the modes as well? Yeah, well, real yeah, so quick. Yeah, we kind of just been talking about the, uh, the free-for-all mode of that. That's the two-to-four player competitive mode, but there's also a solo mode. There's a team mode for four players, teams of two. And the really cool, and there's a boss mode that's a cooperative mode. So on the back of every heroine's board, you have the, like, a big, a big scary, like, boss version of them that you can fight against. So instead of sending it to your opponent, you send them to a boss. And the boss has patterns that, uh, set a configuration, and if you don't have that configuration in your sight at the end of your turn, you suffer some kind of horrible negative effect. So you get to play the, the basic game, but you're also having this whole other thing to deal with as you're playing. So, you know, it kind of plays to all kinds of different player counts, which is really nice. And, and what I like about this is that you guys are also making original soundtrack for this game. Yeah, so one of the one of the big things about shoot games is is the soundtrack. You know, when you're playing a, a shoot 'em up video game, music is is one of the really big fun things to experience. So, uh, since Bullet has an optional timer, a three minute timer that you can play with, we decided to go and make like a full OST for the game. So each heroine like has their own music track that is three minutes long that you can use as a timer if you want, or just listen to the music. As oh, as. That, is, that, that is awesome. Um, I'm a big, for me, I like putting music to match the theme of games that we're playing, so this is just really helpful. I love that. Right. You know, we could have just put, like, a sand ring or something, but, like, what fun is that, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know. That's going to be awesome. Is it going to be available, like, just download the OST, or is it going to be, like, an uh, app? Yeah, it's actually, we're, so we're actually producing the, uh, Plaster Brain is the composer, and their work on the, the OST right now. There's a couple songs up on YouTube already. We have a link to it on our Kickstarter page. So you can kind of see them as they come out over the next couple months. And then, yeah, once it's done, we'll have it. Uh, it'll be available for download and whatnot. That's awesome. That's, yeah. Um, so I there are eight characters that are going to be in the, in the game. Right, um, and they each have their own boss modes as well. Each has their own boss mode. So, are you playing against the character, or you are, right? Like uh, in boss mode, you're playing against their boss form. So you can't you since it's on the back of the board, you can't use a heroine against their own boss form. Gotcha. Or anything in that mode. But okay. in free for all mode, yeah, you play against each other, right? So you're kind of pitting your skill with that character's set of abilities against the other players. So you have. And I do like. The fact that you have the solo mode too especially right now where people are you know socially isolating and so that helps out someone like me who's able to play by himself at home right so both boss mode and score attack are solo focused modes you can play either of those and you'll get you know even if you're just a solo you're gonna get you know all the bang for your buck out of it as what a group of players you know, there's plenty of gameplay in there for solo players that's awesome yeah, definitely. I mean, even if you only play each character once as a solo mode, that's only like, like what five bucks a person? It's I think it's thirty nine for the Kickstarter, um, mm -hmm. which is right. really not. That's a fantastic. Well, deal and you for have that. all the boss modes you can play against too. So not you play them all in solo mode. You can play against each boss with each heroine. So oh it's wow, quite a lot of gameplay. And just for everybody at home, there's two tiers that you can pledge to on this. On Kickstarter, you can get the base game for I believe it's thirty, and then you have the yeah. deluxe edition, which is fifty nine. But that gives you the wooden bullets, if I if I'm not mistaken. Correct. So yeah, for the thirty, it's the base game, and fifteen, and is the wooden bullets. And uh, if you're on the fence about was there a really nice, we had an update uh, where I showed off the component quality and whatnot, and there it's it's quite quite the feel good experience, I would say. So. Uh, it kind of elevates the game quite a bit, having those wooden 
bullets to, you know, kind of click around in your bag and whatnot. Yeah, exactly. You shake them up and it doesn't feel empty and... I, right. I I had a problem yesterday. We we play a game called Quacks of Quedlinburg. It was and I was right, playing with my wife, and uh, and I was reaching into my bag and I pulled out a token that I hadn't bought throughout the entire game, and I couldn't figure out how it got into my bag. And what what I think we finally decided is that that token somehow got stuck inside the bag at oh, some from point a from game. a previous game because it was oh, only like yeah. turn two or three, and I pulled it out. I, I had a really powerful token. I was like, wait a minute, what? And and we just both kind of looked at it, and I and I I had a brain fart, and I couldn't remember if I had bought it or not, which I don't think I did. But so I mean, the wood tokens, like having a big old clacky bag of tokens, is going to be a good feel. And even so, with the punch uh, board, it's it's perfectly like right. They're they're much bigger. They're about an inch by inch, so they're much bigger than Quack's tokens. Uh, quick question though, uh, people who just do the base game, are they going to be able to upgrade to the deluxe tokens in the the pledge manager, or do they need to back the fifty nine dollars just to make sure they get them? No, we'll have a pledge manager press project that you can upgrade your pledge in to deluxe if you like. And uh, the game is on tabletop soon right now, so if you have TTS, you can try the game before you buy it and see if you like it as well. Nice. That's awesome. I one of the we did a video not too long ago, one of our previous podcasts, at, and we asked the viewers what are like the main things you look for when considering backing a Kickstarter, and like some of the most notable ones was a solo mode, um, whether they actually show gameplay, whether they're a company that that has fulfilled many Kickstarters already if they've already had that, and it seems like you're hitting on every cylinder here. You know, you can try Tabletop Simulator, you have the whole rule book, you can chat about it, you have all the variability, um, you have, you know, the extra experience with Soundtrack, and you're getting all of these, uh, like, like just those upgradable components, and it's, as far as component-wise goes, this is it's a very very inexpensive base price for really good quality stuff from what i can tell yeah. 140 punch board tokens 27 power up tiles 12 team action tiles uh one martial uh marial marker two crosshair markers five shield tokens four ap trackers one intensity track, one intensity tracker, 37 boss pattern cards, 79 pattern cards, four reference cards, eight heroin boards that are double-sided, four bags, and a center bag. Good God. Like, that's 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 already, like, those that amount of components you'd expect in, like, a $60, $70 game. Right. You know, we tr you know we're at $12.99, right? So we try to as much content as we can, especially with this project, because this is our first project where we're not doing the stretch goals. So we wanted to make sure we essentially took all the things that we would have made stretch goals and just put them in the game and just be done with it. Yeah. You know, we've kind of ran into problems in past Kickstarters like Collusion Event where we've committed to a bit too much and it's taken, those projects have taken a lot longer than we expected because we've committed to like six mini expansions worth of content in Collusion's case. So, yeah. you know, Fabio's been, you know, talk about the art that Fabio's done. Fabio's been quite busy finishing up Collusion. <laughs> right. With all yeah. that. But uh, it's at press now, so that's great. You can finally get that moving along. That's awesome. Yeah, and then, so anybody who backed the Collusion expansion, ho hopefully we'll be seeing it fairly soon. Um, I don't think there's any set dates or anything yet. Um, uh, our current estimated delivery is, I believe it's October is what I said on my last update. Okay. Uh, so okay. yeah, now that we're pressed, it's going to take a couple of months, you know, for term, for printing. We have to get proofs, you know, digital and physical proofs and whatnot. Yep. So it's going to be a little bit longer, but it's coming. It'll definitely be out this year for certain. Yeah, that that's that's hardly an unreasonable amount of time to wait. I mean, I, I've seen Kickstarter it's go from five years. with everything that's been going on, too. So it, it, a lot of this oh, is yeah. out of your hands, too. Yeah, I mean, there's not much we can do if the printer takes longer because of the virus situation. Yeah. Now. We can only, you know, send the files and, and sit on our hands a bit. And, you know, especially with Collusion, I've been trying to uh, be very, you know, open with everything. We're, we try to be a very open company, and I've been posting updates, like, up until recently, weekly, on Collusion's kicks or about the status of develop and in, like, new cards that people have been seeing and whatnot. So we're definitely going to keep everyone in the loop and up to date on what's going on. 
on our end. And to me, that's what makes a great Kickstarter company is keep open communication. Right. Yeah. We're not trying to hoodwink anybody, right? You know, with Bullet, you know, we show you how the game works. You can literally play the game before you buy it. You don't have to commit to anything. Um, even after you receive the game, we have a replacement spot. See, to where you can get a refund and whatnot. So, you know, we definitely want you to be on board when you get on board. We're not going to send you, like, a box with nothing in it. Yeah. You know, like one of those eBay ads where you buy a PlayStation. It's just the box <laughs> or something. Oh, uh, yeah. Those, those shenanigans, right? No, you, you guys are setting a great standard for this. Um, and I, I do have, like, one hypothetical, and I don't know if, if you have that. We, in our previous uh, disc uh, discussion about Kickstarter games. We talked about uh, Jamie Stegmeier's company, uh, Stonemeyer Games, right. and how he kind of he 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 started with just Kickstarter. He started producing, and then at a certain point, he he flipped it to that. Um, now you guys have way more grounds in Kickstarter than most companies. Is that going to probably stay the same? Uh, as far as us using Kickstarter in the future. Yep. Uh, yeah, I would say so. I mean, we're still. All things considered, we're a fairly small develop studio. We, you know, we're not Fantasy Flight or anything. So, you know, for some of these projects, especially the bigger ones like Collusion and Bullet, there we don't really have much of a choice but to kickstart. But thankfully, we have you know a really big fan base and support for that kind of thing. I think that kickstarters have be kind of become the norm for the board industry. You know, you see, you even see it with the companies. You know, you Frosthaven ended a couple weeks ago with like 13 million so i don't think kickstarter is definitely for us and probably not for most people it's going to go away anytime soon as, as far as funding but i wouldn't say that all of our projects are kickstarter right you know if we did like if we did a new pt or something we'd probably just put that out i wouldn't think that we would need to kickstart a project that small yeah but anything like medium and big sites like an argent or a blaze or something you know it's it's not just about the money too right it is a marketing thing as well you know nobody's going to know that there's an RJ expansion out unless we tell them and what better way to do that than to just launch a new Kickstarter for it right yeah yeah you know we get that we get that extra reach that we wouldn't have normally and then also on the same basis you have direct communication with your customers you know how many are or you can make a much more informed you know order from the publisher or the from the printer knowing hey look we had 10,000 people back this that's 10,000 copies that we know we definitely need to sell and then the rest is the judgment call whereas like if you're going straight to market you got to guess how many people are going to buy it right and the nice thing too about kickstarting is it, it gives us more eyes for our end you know a lot of the times we're not quite done with development when we launch Kickstarter, so have, you know, another couple thousand eyes on the project, you know, it doesn't hurt. Right. You know, sometimes backers will catch things that even I haven't noticed after looking at the game. You know, that that's kind of how it works. And you look at a game for so long, like Bullet's been in about 28 versions, and there's things that I just become numb to because I've seen it sometimes. And someone, like, hey, you misspelled, like, right on a board, and it was like a copy error that I did, like, four months ago or something. Right. So, you know, it's nice to have extra eyes on the project. And it's, you know, good to see what people think, too. It's also kind of a check for the product uh, itself. You know, if we release a mechanic that people don't seem to think is very fun, or like a theme that people maybe aren't jazzed about, like a certain card or something, you know, we can always change things last second. So, exactly. you know, even when we, even when we develop, you know, we're, like you said, we're a very small company. So when we test, you know, we're only testing with like 10 or 20 people max outside of staff. So, you know, it's always nice to have extra eyes on something, I think. That's good. Yeah, definitely. Well, I'm glad to hear, Josh, that you guys are doing uh, as good as you are. I've always been rooting for you. Um, they, you guys are definitely setting a standard as far as just being cool in the industry like the, the, there's a reason board gamers are so passionate about being part of the industry. Like everybody who creates games wants to make that fun experience for everybody. Uh, like it's just it's great to see that we have another team on here for level 99, and and we appreciate you guys taking the time to support our fairly non-existent podcast at the moment. 
and, <laughs> and no problem. I hope I hope we got some more viewers and whatnot. Yeah, definitely. Yes. We we will we will upload this soon. And when we do, we'll let you know about it and feel free to promote accordingly if you want. Sure. Um, but yeah, dude, we appreciate you taking the time to do this. Daniel, do you have any other questions before we go? Uh, no, I don't have any other questions. I just like to mention the fact that I like the fact that Level 99 is doing this in our backyard. This is We live in a state that doesn't get enough love and they're, they're putting this on the board gaming world. Exactly. Like, I mean, up until... Uh, up until recently, Albuquerque was only known for what crystal meth, I think. Um, <laughs> but now it's it's level ninety nine, and then crystal meth, and so. Well, we got Rio Grande also. So. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Technically, Rio Grande Games lives or is based out of is there. It? Technically. Um, Technically. Already, quote unquote. Yeah, I I remember I talked to some of the guys there, and they were they basically said it's like yeah, the only reason that it's still Rio Grande Games because that's what it was named and they have a post office there but mm, pretty much everybody's in Chicago or something like that. <laughs> it's like, oh, oh okay. okay. Yeah, but um, that, that's still really cool. And, <laughs> and New Mexico has such a good board game scene uh, but not enough representation. So you're representing a good chunk of the Southwest right here. All right, well, I hope that uh, everybody checks this out and, you know, gets the word out. Absolutely. So. There's a lot, there's a lot of good game players in New Mexico, I think, you know. Yeah, definitely. So, you no, know, you included Danny. Don't oh no 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 I no you don't need to no. Um, well, first off, thank you. I do appreciate the compliment. I know I'm gonna get a bunch of of hell from my co-host here in a bit anyway to to put me back down from that peak. Uh, well, I didn't say anything. <laughs> uh, you don't need to. I already know what you're thinking. Uh, <laughs> you can't see nothing. <laughs> so Josh uh, stick around with us real quick I'm going to finish up the podcast uh, so hang out for a few minutes and we'll we'll talk then with that sure. being said this has been Board Game Breakdown of Level 99 Games and as always I've been Daniel and Daniel and we want to thank Brad Talton and Joshua uh, Josh uh, Von Lanningham Lanningham how, how do you say your last name Van Lanningham yeah. Van Lanningham yeah uh, we want to appreciate you both, or thank you both for joining us on this awesome podcast. And with that being You're said, welcome. yeah, uh, you want any more shout outs before we get going? Uh, no, just yeah, check out the Bullet Kickstarter if you haven't, and uh, check out, you know, all of our games and see if any of them, you know, tickles your fancy. Awesome. Cool. So check out Level 99 Games, and thank you so much for tuning in on our podcast. If you want to get in contact with us, you can contact us through everydayboardgames2020 at gmail.com or you can chat with us live at on twitch.tv slash everydayboardgames you can also find the re-uploads on uh, youtube at everydayboardgames2020 as well as the audio versions of this at everydayboardgames2020 uh, on podbean and with that being said you have a great day have a good one